Call this evening's meeting to order, please. And we will begin with uh, Dr. Brown's comments. Good evening, board. Happy summer. Uh, you can tell everybody in the audience looks uh, excited to be here this evening. Uh, so here we go. Uh, board members, you have uh, the 23-24 board meeting dates uh, in your packet. Um, you'll notice that there's a combined work session and board meeting in July um, and a combined board meeting and work session in, uh, in June. Um, so you have those uh, for your approval uh, at Monday night's regular session board meeting. Also, you'll have your annual training verification for each board member uh, and the annual training that, that we had to do. We want to thank Amanda for putting that together for us. Uh, item three, governance team um, norms and protocols. Um, we've had extensive conversations uh, regarding this over the last few weeks and months. Um, so this is a living document. Uh, which means that we can make uh, additions, corrections to it. It is also part of Georgia School Boards Association's governance team um, awards, and so that will also be on the consent agenda uh, for Monday night as well. Any questions or comments about that? All of the changes that Mr. Sanders requested have been made. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. It was only 17 different emails on that. Well, I had a great English teacher. You did have a great English teacher. Uh, next item is uh, Georgia School Board's vision resolution. Uh, this is also a part of GSBA's recommendations for school boards uh, as part of the Georgia uh, vision project that we went over during our uh, retreat back in March. Um, so that will be on the consent agenda as well. Um, another item is the Rutland Academy property. Uh, Board members, as you know, our, our GNETS program that was run through our local uh, regional service agency um, is being brought back to our individual school districts um, or combined school districts like us in Madison County are working together on our GNETS program. Uh, so that Rutland property has become available. Uh, each of the school districts inside of our RESA own various percentages of that uh, piece of property. And so what you have before you is an offer made by the Clark County School District uh, for, the, um, for the full price offer um, for what everybody uh, is in, entitled to. So any questions regarding that? Uh, each of the different school districts inside of our RESA have to approve that for the sale to go through um, and Clark County to take over that property. Uh, I don't recall the dollar amount. Um, Anna, you know? Um, the next item in the, on the agenda is the Four Points uh, Charter School. Board members, as you know, uh, we had 90 days to consider the application that was provided to us uh, by Four Points uh, Charter School. That is on the agenda for Monday night. Um, we have Ms. Estabrook uh, from that organization who's with us this evening. Um, do you have any, anything you want to say to the board or uh, please? Questions from Ms. Estabrook. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. All right. That concludes my comments. Uh, Dr. Hardigree with Teaching and Learning. All right. 
Good evening, and I believe Mr. Schultz is up first with a report from summer externships. Turn it over to him. Good evening. I just wanted to kind of give you a brief overview of what we've got going on with teachers who are doing externships with business and industry in our community. Um, this is actually through a, a grant through the Workforce Georgia Teacher Externships um, through the Workforce Northeast Georgia Regional Commission. Um, this is the second year that we've actually had this grant. Last year we had three individuals go through with the grant. This year we had eight. There was one individual that was, uh, because of a family emergency, could not, but we're going to probably try to get them in later on in the, in the summer. But um, the biggest thing what this does is allows teachers and educators to go into the community and really start to work with local industry. Um, it's not only are they able to like, just kind of tour it, they literally go in on the workforce line, they work with the HR. Uh, it gives them opportunities to really kind of see the other side of what's going on in the community. Um, it also prepares our teachers. Um, so like when they make their lesson plans, they can literally do activating strategies that they may have learned something in the summertime. Um, it's, it's really a great opportunity for them. I, I was discussing with some this afternoon. They uh, actually were doing a, a presentation. You can go on to the next one if you want. Um, what it is, it's a five-day externship. Uh, they came in on Monday and actually they met with their individual companies that they worked for uh, or they're going to work for here and then they went to the company in the afternoon, met with HR, all the different um, you know, rules and everything they had to go. Even uh, our individuals that went to Kubota had to have steel-toed shoes. Um, the teachers actually had to buy them, but the grant will actually reimburse the teachers for those, those um, steel-toed shoes. Um, they will work alongside professionals within those companies and um, this Friday they'll actually come back um, that morning and they will give a presentation of what they, a little bit about the company, what they learned, what are some of the things, they'll actually do that, that's part of the grant. Um, we're excited because of the teacher leadership retreat that we have this Friday, we're actually taking uh, teachers, and if I'm going to say that, but um, we're, we're actually going to visit business and industry to do tours. Um, some of our teachers that are actually on the externships are going to share with some of their um, things that afternoon also. So um, we're very excited. I mean, there's, a, there's one more picture if you want to see. Like you said, those are the different ones. Um, we were meeting on, on Monday. And then if you hit the last slide, um, these are the different companies that we are actually working with this year. We have two individuals from, um, that were on from Jackson County Schools that was going to be in each one. SK Battery, we actually, there was one individual from Commerce City Schools that was on there with that team. But um, we've got Julie Cornelius, Lindy, Linda Frederick going over at Tika Tag, um, which there's a lot of robotics and everything going on in there. Uh, Takeuchi, Alma Automo, and Christopher Blaze, or Blazy? Is it Blazy? Blazy. I might apologize on that one. Um, and then Kubota, Stephanie Garrett, Caitlin Dalton, and SK Battery, Aaron Nickinson is there. So um, I'm excited to hear what um, what their experiences are about, but do you have any questions? We do have some teachers um, through CTAE that are going through CTURN, which is also an externship, and they'll be going later on in the summer. So we've got three other CTA teachers that are going to, we have one in our uh, law and public safety is actually going to work with a police academy fire, and I mean, it's, they're gonna be doing a lot of externships right with those industries, so we're excited about the opportunities our teachers are having. So these teachers, are they kind of uh, paired with a company that is, is similar to what they're teaching? Well, no, actually, that's a great, that's a good question. And one of the goals we had was actually not just pairing what they teach. Um, so, for example, Julie Cornelius is a Spanish instructor. Um, Linda Frederick and some of those are English. This is an opportunity for really, because a lot of these core teachers are, are it's, it's a more important or more for them than it is even the CTIE. Because if you really think about a lot of our core teachers, a lot of them went to post-secondary education and then left post-secondary education and came to, to teach in a school. So they've not really had a lot of experience in work industry. So this is a great way where a lot of our teachers um, can you know, really get in there. Something exciting, when we did a little feeler out, we kind of went out, there was almost 50 teachers that like said they had an interest in it. Um, we were, we were able to, to get, you know, nine actually confirmed for the externship this year, but we're excited. Hopefully this will continue to grow and we can get more and more people this opportunity. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. And it is exciting to think about how we can get more of our leaders and teachers thinking about the experiences that we're giving our kids and how we can really make those relate to opportunities that they will have in the future. And that was some of our work. I'm going to ask our um, teaching and learning team to come on up because we're going to share a little bit. We are all on kind of a high from coming off of two incredible weeks with our teachers and leaders. Um, we had about 200 teachers with us over the last couple of weeks doing some incredible work. So we had an ambitious plan, but I want to give a shout out to this team. They are all very talented, very hardworking, um, and just work so well together. So I'm super proud of our teaching and learning team and super proud of our teachers because our teachers showed up and they were passionate and just very dedicated to the work. And we, like I said, we had an ambitious plan, but we actually got more done than we even ever thought that we could. So I do want to welcome, we've got um, a few new team members. We have Lisa Ellis with us now officially as Director of Elementary Education. So she did a great job leading teams this week. And we also have Lisa Wilbanks and Tracy Kopke, who are new to our team. And that media team, we could not have done it without their leadership and the, the team behind because we did so much organization. As you know, with CARES, we um, had the great opportunity to really get resources in place. But now we've been able to really organize the curriculum so that it aligns to those resources and we have clarity. Um, so I'll get them to advance the slides a little bit and we'll share about what this work, it, it really has started way before the summer. This is just putting in practice a lot of the work that was started really about a year ago. Um, as a team, we started planning for this summer learning summit and design team really probably back in about October or November. We kind of started putting it on the whiteboard and thinking about how can we put into action what we are talking about with our teachers, which is going back to that understanding by design framework and really digging into our standards, understanding those standards and having clarity, speaking a common language about instruction and putting in place the, the needed um, building blocks for a strong instructional cycle so that we have clarity about our standards, what we want our students to know and be able to do, what will be the success indicators of that, how will we measure that, that leads us to those common assessment pieces, and then having all of the pieces in place for strong data teams or professional learning communities within our school. So again, that's, that's a pretty ambitious plan for within a year to get a lot of those pieces in place, but our teachers are very much on board and very excited about getting these building blocks kind of back in place because if you've been with us for a while these are pieces that we we did have in place at one time but we've had new standards roll out we've had a pandemic we've hired a lot of new teachers we've gotten new resources so just being able to really shore that back up has been very exciting so i know that our team's excited to present some of the highlights of that um, we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide there just going back to the, the four teaching and learning priorities that we've been really focusing on this year, the work that we've been doing aligns to instructional clarity, and like I said, getting in place the building blocks for a culture of continuous improvement. Because to have that strong collaboration at the school level and at the district level, we have to have common pieces that we're able to look at and kind of bring back that student work and talk about where we're uh, meeting the mark and where we need to continue to work with our students. And then we've continued to really hone in on K-12 literacy, knowing that that's a thread that runs through it all, and then organizing all of these pieces so that we can effectively and efficiently deliver the curriculum to our students in that digital learning environment. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jamie Harris and Darrell uh, McMenemy are going to share a little bit from the math and literacy side about the UBD work. Good evening. So as Dr. Hardegree mentioned, we've been using the UBD framework as kind of our guiding force for doing all this curriculum work. And one thing that Darrell and I are, were talking about earlier that we were so excited about is how much of this is owned by the teachers. They have done this work. You know, we've, we kind of brought the framework to them, we've pulled them together and allowed for that collaboration, but their expertise has really driven this work and made it what it is. And so this year we've really walked them through these three stages of understanding by design. Um, looking at their standards, stage one is where you really decide, okay, what do kids need to know? Like what, what are the building blocks of what they need to understand? 
um, to have success. And then moving into stage two with building assessments and deciding, okay, how are we gonna measure that? How are we gonna see if they really know what they need to know? And so looking at those assessments. And then we've even this week been able to move into stage three and look at, well, what resources are teachers gonna use day to day to make sure kids are getting what they need so they can be successful and show that mastery on those assessments. And so that's kind of what our teachers have walked through. And you can see on the slide there, one question we've asked them this week, because this week has really been kind of the culmination of a year's worth of work, you know, what is the purpose of this UBD work? You know, why have we been doing what we've been doing and, and spent all this time? And um, the things that our teachers continually said were that this has allowed us to focus on student learning and really think about what do they need to learn and how. It has allowed them to collaborate. It has allowed them to have alignment across the district and vertically and has given them a sense of collective ownership that these, all these kids are all of our kids. Not these kids are my kids and those kids are your kids, but we own all the kids in Jackson County. And so that's been kind of the work of this week. And um, again, just to reiterate how proud we are of our teachers. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Darrell, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, math because they've had new standards and had a huge lift. So, well, like she just said, we had new math standards this year, the Georgia's K-12 math standards. So we had two weeks of math work this weekend last week where our K-5 teachers really dove into that UBD work, unpacking those standards and doing all of the things that Jamie so passionately shared with you a moment ago. And the teachers worked extremely hard and they were able to finish all of the units, which was amazing. And that's because of their collaboration and their work ethic and their excitement. They were super excited to do this work. So thank you for that opportunity from them and from us. Can you guys? Yeah. Hello everybody. Um, one of the things I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in a moment is the assessments. Um, we mentioned those earlier. And we are establishing some common assessments, um, particularly in our core courses. And the purpose of that is to support what you see on the screen there, which is uh, where a group of teachers, you know, say that are teaching biology or whatever course they may be, are working collaboratively to look at uh, that same UBD process. So um, looking at evidence of student learning, are they learning what we want them to learn? And if they're not, what are we gonna do about it collectively? And so that just shows you uh, that cycle and it's an ongoing process and there's sort of multiple levels of that cycle where you're doing it unit by unit, but also week to week and day by day. Um, and so if we keep going from there, we'll go to the next slide. Um, one of the pieces that we're putting in place to support all that, like Dr. Hardigree said, is um, taking those curriculum resources and putting them online where they're easily accessible for teachers. And uh, Lisa and Tracy are gonna share that with you uh, a little bit. Sorry, we have to switch over. Oh, yeah. So one of the pieces that we've been redesigning this year is the curriculum portal for teachers. So um, it's built in our learning management system in Canvas, and um, we're building a portal that is K-12, so teachers can look vertically as they need to um, to see what's happening in the um, in the grades above and below them. So um, we've shown you a sample of this before, kind of the bare bones. This week was awesome, and last week because we were able to start getting the um, the pieces in here. And our media specialist team has been wonderful about helping us in the last two weeks. Um, we had a document, so when teachers, when design teams finish documents and were ready for us to um, put them into the Canvas course, they, were, they marked it on the document and our team was ready to go. And within even just a few minutes sometimes, we had it ready for them. And so it was just seamless work throughout the week. So I'll show you fifth grade, for example. So a teacher would drill down and um, click on a subject that they're teaching. So all the fifth grade um, science things would be here. It starts and they see their curriculum map and then they have each of their units, the U, all the UBD work that the teachers did. And it's um, just easy for them to see, it's streamlined. It includes everything that they're gonna need to teach those, um, those units within that class, including all the resources that are vetted and ready to go. And on the other side of it, so the other part that we have been pulling from all of the work that they've been doing, and they have, I, I wish we had recordings of how excited they have been. Um, this is just the example for the student side. So we're also working on those templates that are gonna be pushed out to the teachers to be able to use with their kids. And then we've been able to also take the work that they have been putting together, and this is all from 
ninth grade literature that they have just been loading this. So these are all resources that are gonna be on the student side that they're gonna be able to publish and the students will be able to use it. So it has just given both resources, the student and the teachers, it's, it's been great work that they've been doing all, all the last two weeks. So, so that is that. So the, the two big products that we have coming out of these two weeks, one is what those ladies just showed you on Canvas and pulling all those resources into an easily accessible place for teachers and students. The other big sort of product um, that is coming out of are the common assessments themselves. And we're using a new a platform that's new to us. It's called DNA, which stands for Data and Assessment. And that really highlights the two strengths um, that it provides for us. It's a, uh, on one hand, it provides really high quality item banks so that when, when teachers are sitting down to create these common assessments, these tests, they've got really great questions to pull from. And that, that's one of the things that really streamlined our work these last two weeks is because teachers weren't sitting there trying to search all online or you know, create from scratch. They really could pull from something that was um, already high quality. And then the other side of that, and I think if we go to the next slide, we'll get into some, um, some previews of this. The other side of it is the data side, which is we give the test. And, and what's happened in the past is when we've asked teachers to really look at assessment data, that means somebody, them or an instructional coach or someone in the school, having to sit down and put that stuff into a spreadsheet and make graphs and charts. And that is really time, you know, time uh, intensive. And so the DNA platform really streamlines a lot of that. And we get, and if we go on to the next slide, I think we get um, sort of just a glimpse of that where uh, teachers develop this assessment, they give it to their students, and then that, that data analysis happens automatically so that they can pull up the platform and they can see an overview like this, which just gives a, gives a snapshot of, you know, how many students do I have at these different performance levels, ones that are on track versus ones that still need some more work, and they have some other reports they can dig into to look more specifically by standard or by particular item. Um, as they go. And we also, another thing I want to point out is when we have developed these, we've taken kind of a unique approach so that there are common district-wide items. So if I'm teaching biology at East High or at Jackson County High, there's a part of that assessment that's going to be common across us, across the schools, but there's a, another part of that where each of those teacher teams have that autonomy to make some adjustments and additions based on their particular students and, and what they need to do within their class, um, which is not the way that districts typically approach um, common assessments like that. Well, we all realized we needed a way to organize the work that they needed to do as a team so that the team could see the work, so that leaders could see the work, so that we could have people reviewing their work. And we also needed our media team to be able to see the work that was done so the media team could do their work. So we came up with this tracker sheet and we put in every unit that a course has based on the state's standards. And then they hyperlinked their curriculum UDD documents as they did it. And then we had drop downs in these. So it's really fun to look. This is what it would look like before we started. It was all red, not done. And then it was, there was an in progress and then a done. And so as the teachers finished, and it was a very selective group of teachers, there's four teachers from all over the district <coughs> working together. They would mark when they were done. They would put their test blueprint and then the test the media team, once it was finished on their end, they were able to upload it to Canvas, they could mark done. So it, I kind of think it was exciting for all of the teachers, almost a little bit um, uh, competitive to watch as other teams are finishing things and motivational. And then they would get so excited when they saw the media team mark it done, and then they could go to the Canvas and we could see it all come into fruition. It's just great projects. So you can see that we just have a few things left. This course won't be next year, so we didn't really need to do that one yet. But it was good for you guys to see just the total progress. And you can just see the amount of work in the, the units that are under each course. And this is just math, 612. So we did that. We did this course K-12 every subject. And if you'll advance the slide. So our next steps, now that we have these assessments, we'll obviously need to work through our PLCs this year. So we, as a PL team, will be supporting all of that data and all of that instructional planning that happens as a result of these common assessments. We'll keep, doc, keep notes all year about things that maybe we need to change and work on for next summer. We're going to be training our new teachers and our veteran teachers on our new assessment platform, DNA. We'll do that during our new teacher orientation and pre-training. And supporting the professional learning of all of our 
find the resources like our HMH materials for our statewide math, square and math standards, um, our new geos and all the literacy books we've got. So we will be supporting that professional learning all year as well. So we have a, a lot of work to do in our state too. Next year. <laughs> And I think our teachers will want to come back for next year's learning summit because they really did thank us over and over. And that's the last slide. We had to kind of laugh at ourselves because we gave four qualifiers and the worst one was fine. So we're like, okay, well, nobody said it's fine. <laughs> so maybe we'll change those next time and give them the opportunity to. <laughs> But as you can see, they all were in the upper two um, categories and excellent, very good. And really, uh, we could go on and on with the, the different things that just they said in their comments, but really, they see the value in this work. And, um, you know, giving up your first week or two weeks of summer shows that you really believe in that work. And even today, we had them here until after the time that, you know, they were required to be here because they were so committed. And they also really enjoyed building those relationships across the district that they'll come back to as they have questions or as you know they they need that collaboration throughout the year so just getting those teachers together from all of our schools is really exceptional our leaders did a great job of selecting the right teachers to be here and supporting that work and we just appreciate all of your support um, for our teaching and learning team and goals and just our, our teachers and students because it, it makes you proud when you have weeks like this where you just really get into the good work. So we appreciate the opportunity to share. Any questions for us? All right. Thank you, Beans. Dr. Hardigree and team, I uh, want to thank you um, for the organization being systematic and uh, putting together a tremendous amount of resources uh, for our teachers to help them and ultimately thank our teachers for all the hard work that they did um, over the last couple of weeks to pull all this together. Human resources, Ms. Todd? Well, we haven't been busy at all. We've just been sitting around with our feet up, eating donuts. Everything is fine. Everything's, Everything's fine. fine. <laughs> We're fine. Um, no, we are in the wonderful world and time of closing out one school year and transitioning into another all at the same time. Um, so you will see this evening a, a, a rather lengthy personnel report, but that just means our principals and supervisors have been very busy um, working to secure their staff. As of today, we have 25, 25 certified positions left to fill district-wide and 20 classified school level positions left to fill. And so this feels very, very stressful for our principals when it's theirs left to fill. But from a district perspective, we are trending in the right direction. We are right at 95% staffed. So we are heading in the right direction, but it is very stressful on our, our leaders when their building isn't fully staffed just yet, but we're on, we're on our way. Um, we are set to welcome around 200 new staff members for the next school year. And we are planning our new hire meet and greet. It is on July 24th. We're collaborating with our teaching and learning team. And they will, that will kind of be the kickoff to new teacher orientation. So we're very excited about that. And I wanted to just take some time to show you one of the ways we're providing our new staff information during onboarding. So this is our new employee launch pad. And this was started before I got here. The HR team got this going and we've just been able to expand upon it and add more to it. And it's a site where our employees can go and get a wealth of information related to their um, new positions and to our district. It's basically a one-stop shop for HR. And so as you can see, we've got videos, welcome messages. Um, we won't watch that one from Dr. Brown. <laughs> but as you can see, I told Jeffrey, just scroll through here. I mean, there is information for our teachers with videos, helpful tutorials on how they can access all of the different benefits options. All of that is in this one location. And it's kind of our way to give that personal feel um, the videos and the photos, they'll have pictures of the staff members at their school, people that were, should be there to help them. Um, gives them that personal feel while we're growing. We always want to make sure that we show our new hires how much we value community and connection. So this is the way that we can connect on a personal level with over 200 new employees coming in. 
any questions about any of that. There's a ton of information in there, but it and it's available that they can go back and reference. So, yeah. all right, no questions. Thank you very much, Miss Todd. Dr. Waxter with Student Support Services. Welcome. Thank you, sir. I appreciate uh, Student Services not getting skipped tonight. That I got an opportunity to speak so thank you dr brown i appreciate it though i might regret it once i'm done right um just real quick i had two things to mention uh you'll find in your packet about the uh foothills uh new agreement as you're aware uh this past state legislature house bill 87 changed the operations of alternative charter schools and that also includes foothills okay so this agreement addresses those changes um but just so that we're aware, Foothills is a school choice option designed to provide opportunities for students who have dropped out of high school or at high risk of dropping out of high school or recover credits or would otherwise benefit from a non-traditional setting to obtain a high school diploma. This agreement, as you can see up there at the top in yellow, it's with over 15 surrounding school districts, okay, us included, including uh, RISA. And one significant change in the agreement because um, I'm just going to go over some highlights of it, uh, is that the Foothills will now hire SROs who will remain on site during operational hours. Uh, in terms of enrollment and funding, FTE funding, all residents of Jackson County School System uh, who qualify will be allowed to enroll at Foothills. Uh, students, regardless of age, who are enrolled in Foothills by June 30th, tw uh, 2023, will be grandfathered as enrolled students until they graduate or withdraw from Foothills. And one last thing on the funding, uh, Foothills claims FTE funds for Foothills enrolled students starting fall 2023, while Jackson County School System claims FTE counts for Foothills program students beginning at the same time, fall 2023. In the second document, it's a chart breakdown. Um, and this is the Foothills roles and responsibility planning chart that we will follow along with uh, Foothills as we fulfill it collaboratively. Uh, just a couple of things. This chart's broken down into four groups, okay? There's Foothills, there's the partner, partnering school districts, the governance board, and the Department of Education, and it's throughout 11 categories. Now, you're going to see on this chart, it's going to say enrolled students and program students. It's my understanding that an enrolled student, enrolled students are no longer enrolled in another school and are seeking a Georgia-accredited high school diploma through Foothills, Okay. And a program student is one who needs to make up or earn coursework to remain in their high school and graduate with their peers when space is available. So when you're looking through that chart, I think it separates it, right? It says enroll. That, those are what uh, those two classifications are. Um, a lot of the details of everything else are, are really in page two and three of the first agreement. Any questions on that? Okay. Moving on to enrollment. Um, so, as you know, we're a growing district. Um, these numbers are based on the ending enrollment of 2021-2022, these percentages I'm getting ready to give you, okay? So in year 22, 20, at, the, at the end of year 2022, we were sitting at 9,333. Everyone see that? Yeah? So we, at the end of this year, we're at 10,100, okay? Uh, that's a growth of 8.22%, okay? 8.22 8 percentage points. Uh, as I kept digging, I wanted to see what it looked like with elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Elementary school growth is at 9%, 9.3%. Middle school growth is at 9.78%. And at high school, it's at 8.12. Okay, so our biggest chunk right now is really middle schools and elementary. And then just to close up, I used to do this in my classroom when I was a teacher. I would do the top five, okay? So... Just playing around and having some fun. The top five, right, in percentage growth as schools. At number five is East Jackson Middle School, okay? They're at 9.22% in growth. Number four is West Jackson Middle at 9.94. Number three, what might shock you a little bit, is actually East Jackson Elementary School with a growth at 10.35%. And then Jackson County High School comes in at number two at 12.35%. And I think we're all aware who's number one, um, and that's North Jackson Elementary at 21.4% in growth this year. Um, 
any questions on enrollment? <laughs> All right, thank you. And I, I've spoken with uh, Ms. Martha Wilson and her team. Um, we have uh, withdrawn around 100 students um, and not counting pre-K kids and kindergarten kids at this time, we're up about 300. Um, so that 10,100 number is going to be closer to 11,000 than 10,000. Um, what we don't know is how far and how close it's going to be to 11,000. So that is going to be a challenge for our district as we move into next school year is being able to forecast the growth, um, where the growth is and, and how fast it's happening. So thank you. All right, Mr. Hooper. Good evening, board. Uh, I want to start tonight uh, by uh, inviting you all to the Legacy Knoll ribbon cutting. Uh, it'll be Saturday, July 29th. Uh, we moved it uh, four hours up to 10 a.m. Uh, th there's a rumor that it's hot in Georgia um, in July, and so we figured why not do a morning. Uh, so we'll start a ribbon cutting at 10. We'll have the band students there from Jackson County High School and Legacy Knoll Middle School. Um, they will do the national anthem. We'll hear from, from some speakers. And then uh, we'll have some business partners set up inside the cafeteria, and then we'll uh, we'll have tours, uh, guided tours, and let people uh, make their way through the building to see the uh, the building. Uh, it's uh, coming along very nicely. I know there's some pictures later on, so uh, that'll be Saturday, uh, July 29th. It's the Saturday before school starts. Uh, it's two days into pre-planning for our teachers, so hopefully they'll have some of their classrooms set up, and uh, should be a great event. Uh, the next thing is the Heroes uh, Elementary Groundbreaking. Uh, as you can tell, I got super creative with the layout on these uh, graphics. They look very similar. Uh, but that'll be Monday, August 14th uh, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, right there uh, at, at the site of Heroes. They are moving dirt already. Uh, flew the drone over the, the property today, and it looks uh, beautiful um, as they're, they're preparing. Uh, but that'll be uh, before a board meeting, uh, so we'll have a board meeting uh, potentially uh, on closer to Heroes Elementary where we don't have to travel as far. So, um, But that'll be at 4.30, uh, and we thank Carol Daniel Construction for helping us set up both of these events. We've been in uh, communication with them and, and how we can make these events really great. So uh, looking forward to both of those. And then finally, uh, the annual report, it's done. Uh, I started this in February, and I really want to thank our leaders uh, for getting us all this information. Uh, there's information from about every department in Jackson County Schools and from every school. So uh, really it was a collaborative effort, everybody coming together and getting the information. Um, so some highlights for you. Uh, page three, we have a welcome from the board uh, and Dr. Brown. Uh, you know, welcoming uh, all of our new people, uh, new residents into Jackson County, a little bit about the school system. Uh, page four is a quick facts. Uh, you see the number right there. Dr. Brown talked about the growth. Uh, our current students, uh, 10,414 is what's already enrolled, uh, according to Ms. Wilson, for uh, August. So we use that number right there. Uh, some breakdowns. The class of 2023 20, achievements, uh, 60, I think it's 65 colleges and universities to highlight what they've done, the, the scholarships, the, uh, the men and women who are going to the military, so uh, highlight them. Uh, next page was kind of an enrollment of what our schools are going to look like next year with that projected number. Dr. Brown saying close to 11,000, went 10,800 to give some, some of our residents an idea of where our schools are going to be at next year. Um, and then we highlighted the fact that we raised over 11,000 for United Way. Um, and I give a little credit to East Jackson High School, which had the, the most donations uh, for, during that. Uh, the next thing, uh, the next page is our future, uh, Legacy Knoll Middle School and Heroes Elementary, uh, highlighting the fact that those were paid without bond money. Um, so I think that's a really important factor for our community to know. Um, next thing is the class of 2023. That's 65 colleges and universities they were accepted to, the military branches they're going to. Uh, it, it's really kind of funny. I had the number of colleges and universities from the class of 2022. 2023, both classes got into 65 colleges and universities, like to a total. I, I didn't even have to change the number when I did it. So kind of a weird fact there that they both got into 65 colleges and universities. Uh, they go as far as California. There is one student going to Cal State Fullerton. I believe that was from uh, maybe Jackson County High School. Um, so uh, going close uh, and going very far away as well. So um, 
and the graduations were obviously tremendous events. And then after that, it gets into our school breakdowns. Uh, it, there's several pages of schools. We had the high schools together, uh, East Jackson Middle School and a power are gonna be together, and then our two West Side Middle Schools. Uh, these pages break down the student enrollments from last year, the demographics, uh, highlights their accomplishments, how many faculty and staff are there, their websites, their principals for next year, their social media uh, hashtags, and so give as much information as we could about, um, about the schools uh, for people who are moving in uh, or maybe are here and, and have young children who are about to enroll into our school system. And then last couple of pages, our Teachers of the Year uh, for this past year. Um, their, uh, their time as our Teachers of the Year are coming to an end because we're going to start the new one in September, and we'll have a, a bunch of more group of teachers that we can bring in on panels and bother a bunch throughout the year as we did these last. I uh, bet they're probably tired of seeing emails from us like, hey, come sit in on this panel. Um, but they're in there, uh, and it's a great honor, obviously. And uh, then our retirees. Uh, I did some quick math, and I had uh, Anna make sure my math is right because I don't do numbers. Um, 509 years of combined service for our retirees uh, that are leaving uh, the Jackson County School System. Them. Uh, we got to meet a lot of them at our last board meeting. So, and then uh, the last page as the back page, uh, our sponsors, uh, Peach, Peach State Federal Credit Union uh, is, is donating uh, a great deal of money for us to make this possible. Wilco Printing is going to be doing our printing, and uh, Main Street News is helping us distribute it. So, uh, the great sponsorships and partnerships we have with them. So, that's all I have for you guys tonight. Anything? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Dodge? And Ed, great job with that, uh, with, with the annual report. Um, board members, with that high shoals, or the uh, Heroes Elementary groundbreaking um, in August, the plan would be to have our board meeting um, that Monday night at Legacy Knoll. So we'd do it right there in the cafeteria at Legacy Knoll so we wouldn't have to travel back here for the board meeting. So. Good evening. Um, we are getting closer and closer to the end of a school year, and um, I'm grateful to say that our numbers are still looking great on all sides. SPLOST is down just a little bit um, from last year, but I think that with you know some fear of maybe the economy and where things are where things stand and where they're going that people are kind of reeling in their spending a little bit but nothing significant and it still leaves our 12-month average well above a million dollars so we're still in a good place with SPLOST and we're sitting in a very good place as far as what we have left to spend on Legacy Knoll and that'll leave us money to get started on Heroes so we're in a good place with SPLOST funds. And our general fund, I'm very excited to say, we are at 92% of the year completed and we have only spent 90% of our budgeted expenditures. So with that 2%, if we continue in, in that direction, that will put us at a fund balance somewhere between 29 and $30 million for this year. So that's, that's a great thing. So everyone being conservative and really, really watching what they're spending um, is really gonna help us start in a great place for next year. And then if you want to look at the comparison, it is down a little bit from, from this time last year, but again, our expenditures are trending, actually trending to be less each month than more. So it, again, it looks like the will end in a very good place for, for the end of fiscal year 23. And then the last thing we have is the really fun part, the tentative budget for next year. And um, last month, of course, we uh, presented to you the, the budget overview and the numbers and the figures. And really what I wanted to do was focus mainly on a couple of, couple of slides. And the first one is budget highlights. I wanted just to remind everyone of the things that are included in this budget and that we've been able to do um, with your support and blessing, and that's the $2,000 plus 2% pay increase for teachers, the complete um, redesign and realignment of our salary schedules for certified non-teaching, classified, and administrative. Um, we have set aside $5 million for future land acquisition and possibly um, the completion of Heroes Elementary. And we've done all this and the budget's balanced. We are, we are not eating into fund balance for any of that. So that's, that's a huge accomplishment. And so thank you, thank you for your support with all that. 
and hopefully we'll we'll be even better when we actually get the tax digest in and and you know it very possibly could be more than what we have projected in in this initial budget but again you've got a copy of this you've got a copy of the tentative budget and you can see where everything lands for that and so then the the last thing I wanted to point out are some kind of some points of interest that I think a lot of a lot of the citizens don't really know and um, one is that our tentative budget is is based on a very conservative estimate of property taxes. We have not received the tax digest yet and we have not set a millage rate. So we have to project based on what little information we have and try to be very conservative with that so that we can actually plan and stay within our budgeted revenues. Um, also, the tax commissioner collects 2% of every dollar that is collected for school taxes. So they collect the money and they collect it based on what we've levied, but then hold 2% of that. Um, this past year, based on the millage and the millage rate that we, or the digest of the millage rate that we levied, it was almost a million dollars. $944,000 is what they withheld from our revenue. So what happens, it's a shift of revenue from school system operations to local government operations. So that's just, that's just another thing for you know, for people to understand and to keep in mind is that we don't get every penny that that the funds are levied on. And also, people just love to dip into our pockets. Um, so the state also gets five mils of the millage rate that we levy. So of 16.576 mils, the state automatically gets five mils of that to help fund the QPE for, uh, funding formula. It's an 80-20 pretty much an 80-20 split. So the state funds 80% of that, what they calculate we earn, and then we give back in our local fair share 20% of that amount. So that's just another piece that I think that people may not realize is that a good five to six mils of what we've levied are going back to other organizations. So that's just, just some pieces of information that, that people might find helpful when they're looking at our numbers it's it's five mils it's pretty close yeah and so what they do I don't want to get too much into this because it's it, boring <laughs> but basically they they let they take back five mils from every school system and they calculate it and if that amount is more than 20 percent of the QBE earnings they prorate it and roll it back to where it is a 20-80 split. So technically, yes, we give five mils, but it might end up being 4.98 mils if, if statewide all the digests have, have grown. And most of the time they haven't because some of that money goes back into equalization, which helps fund the districts that are you know, more rural and lower income. Yes, it's kind of a redistribution of, of funding. And and what school district receives the most equalization funds in the state? I don't I know. Let's do a, a little quiz. I think that would be a good piece of information for our community. So what? You're you're correct. Gw Gwinnett County receives the most in equalization. Mm-hmm. 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 Gwinnett. So we have the most legislators in our state doesn't make them free. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting to look at. But we do not receive equalization and we probably never will because of just because of our county wealth. But um and City of Jefferson school system does not receive it either, but City of Commerce has that that could change with with the dynamics of, of industry that's in that city limits. So and then the rest, oh, sorry, the rest is just is just pieces from the previous presentation, just to remind you of kind of how our revenues are made up and our um, expenditures are made up, and some of the things that um, created the the changes in our budget for this year, the increases and the additional positions that we had to hire. But that's it. And if y'all have any questions, of course, reach out anytime and let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dodge.
Mr. Schofield. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Board, it's uh, great to have an opportunity to speak to you tonight. I have uh, some updates from the operations side. also have a few board items to bring forth for approval on Monday night uh, for discussion tonight. So it's an extremely busy time in the operations department. Uh, if you're out and about in the schools, you see a lot of movement going on. Uh, of course, Legacy Knoll coming up and groundbreaking going on over at Heroes, but that's just a small portion of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, you walk in our schools and, you know, the hallways are filled with desks so that custodial crews and our maintenance staff are going in and out. And uh, it's that time of year, so we're making a lot of improvements and cleaning our facilities thoroughly. Uh, just a lot going on. Uh, it's also uh, this time of year for conferences, just for, to be aware. Uh, GEMA has a school safety conference in two weeks, the third week in June. Uh, that will be held in Athens. We'll have representation there from our district. Uh, GAPT, which is our pupil transportation organization, will be meeting in Jekyll that same week. Uh, we'll also, the following week, we'll have a facilities conference, which will be represented there as well. Uh, so just be aware of those type of things. I do want to bring to your attention uh, the Georgia Association for Pupil Transportation will induct uh, Mr. Peterson, uh, our, our transportation director, is their president. Uh, so he'll be the president of that organization this upcoming year. So he'll be inducted into that role during the conference. Uh, we're excited for him. Uh, I'll just give a, a shout out to the Associated Pupil Transportation Association in Georgia. It's a leader across the nation. Uh, of course, I've been very familiar with that that world. Uh, I'm just very proud of what they've done and how they've grown. And I'll just say this: with Mr. Peterson's leadership, it'll it'll grow even more. So we're excited about that. Excited about the opportunity for him because it's a big deal to be in that role uh, and to, to serve in that capacity for the state. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Peterson to come up and give you a brief update on a, just a few items going on in pupil transportation. Thank you, Pat, and thank you. First, I want to say thank you all for allowing me to join Guys County Schools. It's an exciting time. We do have a lot going on. We have started our radio installation uh, as of this afternoon, and Pat will tell you I'm crazy about numbers and all that fun stuff. 27 buses have been installed, so they're working daily to get those in. Um, our next other exciting adventure is our GPS system um, that will be coming up. As you can see, our here is our Traversa. This shows you what our route sheets are going to look like next year. Um, there's a whole lot more information that will be on there for the drivers. We just pulled the students' names off for tonight's presentation. But they'll have the students' name, grade, emergency contact information. And as you can see, they'll know left turn, right turn. So it, that helps us with making sure our routes are running efficiently and in a timely manner. And then when we need to make adjustments, it's a matter of just sitting down in a few clicks and, and making those adjustments. Um, our next item of information is our GPS. Uh, that installation started on Tuesday. We have 55 buses that already have their units in. Uh, they will be completed by next Tuesday. Um, and as you can see, we can do um, live views, watching the buses wherever they're at in the country. Um, we can see what they're doing. They open their doors when the yellow lights come on, red lights, crossing gate, speed. They're going to love that one. Um, <laughs> We can also, uh, if you scroll down just a little bit more, uh, we also have vehicle history. I can go back five years and see where a bus was at a particular time. So when Mr. Pat calls me and tells me I didn't come by his house, I can pull it up and go, yes, sir, we were there at this time. The door was open, um, yellow lights, and all that came on. And then one other uh, exciting new tool that with this program, and I've had um, dealings with this program for quite a while, is we can also see DOT and national weather overlay over the routes. So if Maysville's got a storm, I'll know where it's at. If the DOT, we've all know 124 is bumper car zone, as we well know. So we know when there's uh, weather and accidents going on that we can reroute buses to get our students home in a timely manner. And that's all I have. If you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, Safety and security updates, um, just for the board's information, we have submitted an application for some Safer Georgia Schools grant with the Department of Ed. 
Uh, I think you may have received some of that information on the side. We didn't put it in your packet tonight. Uh, Mr. Kent's been working diligently with that, uh, and you're excited about that opportunity. We'll we'll bring that forth if that grant is is comes to fruition if we're awarded any funds. Uh, Mr. Kent is working diligently also to update our school safety plans. Uh, the, he's actually trying to develop a template for each of our schools to use uh, to align with some legislation that was passed this past legislative session, just to align with state law. Uh, he's also working to get uh, all these standardized across the district. So, so I heard teaching and learning talking about standardization, and uh, we're working on that there as well uh, in safety and security. So from that side of things, we think we're progressing. Uh, just a lot of work going on there as well. We're also upgrading some cameras across the district, and uh, the, the school safety money is kind of coming into to fruition as we're kind of updating some of those systems. Uh, at this time, I'd also like Mr. Farmer to come provide some uh, updates on our facilities and what's going on there. Thank you, Ms. Schofield. I don't know that I'll be as brief as Mr. Peterson, but Dr. Brown Board, I appreciate you allowing me to speak. Just to uh, bring some uh, pictures to some things that we have been doing uh, throughout the summer and also before that, rolling into the summer. As you can see here, this is the uh, backdrops for the East Jackson uh, High School baseball and softball. They have been redone. You can see the knee wall and the nets have been completed. We still have some infield work to do and some cosmetic things. Down at the bottom, you can see the uh, tennis courts, and uh, they they really look amazing in, in what they've done compared to what they were. The cracks are gone. The the courts have been resurfaced. The lines have been restriped, and uh, it really just looks professionally. So um, we are excited about that. A lot of the other things that we've been doing, the mobile classrooms are a, a big deal to us. We are ahead of schedule. Uh, West Jackson Elementary, the ones that uh, hybrid spore that were going there have been delivered today, and uh, they should be set up uh, by this evening. Uh, North Jackson Elementary, uh, they have been delivered and also set up. And then um, uh, West Jackson Middle School, they will start removal tomorrow of the 22 that are there, and four of those will be moving over to Gum Springs. So we are very proud to say that we are ahead of schedule on that project. Also, to Legacy Knoll Middle School, uh, this is something that uh, continues to rock along, and uh, we are very happy to report that everything is on schedule, and um, our final flooring and paint touch-ups are underway. Kitchen equipment startup is underway, which is very important to make sure that everything is running smoothly when school starts. Troubleshooting of our low voltage systems, HVAC, and all MEPs uh, have begun. Architect and owner's punch list is set for mid-June. I will go ahead and tell you that that has already begun uh, by Carol Daniel. Synthetic turf is being installed. If you have been by there, you can see it looks like a sea of gravel. But uh, they're fixing to start laying the, the artificial turf, so we're very excited about that. Irrigation and sod and start, starts uh, being installed in mid-June. Uh, this will be a, a tedious project, but uh, I hope that uh, everything goes well with that, and uh, it's expected to start that time. It could be a couple of days earlier, but that's the expectation right now. The final asphalt placement is complete, uh, so we are ready to begin the uh, uh, last coating of asphalt on the top coat. Now upcoming and planning things that we have going on for Legacy, we've got uh, training on all our systems. That will include the maintenance department, plant managers, and anyone that uh, has uh, anything to do with the infrastructure of the school. Also the uh, principal and some of the staff will be involved in that also. Furniture installation will begin on the, the end of June. Last week in June, we uh, will start before the 4th of July, so we will get a jump start because we expect our uh, us to move in as a school on June, July the 10th, and uh, that date is set, and we will meet that date. Uh, ribbon cutting, as Mr. Uh, Hooper provided, it will be 729. Have any questions thus far? All right, let's look at some pictures. All right, so here...
show me the bones and the skeleton of it throughout this whole process, but this is actually the finished product here. As you can see, the finished hallways, uh, the ram board is on the floor to protect it, uh, but you can see just how it's done. The soil cement, uh, which is a mixture of cement and soil together to make it uh, hard and adhere, is uh, bound in the final asphalt, um, showing it's going to be laid clean. Synthetic turf, which is kind of what I was talking about, you can see the size of the shape of the project, and uh, this is this, this is quite the interface. It's still thick stuff. The gym flooring, um, it's it's excellent. It's special looking, and we're very proud of that. As you can see, the Elko logo in the center. The final hardscaping is being installed. A lot of the cosmetic work that you see is now being done. And you'll see that start coming more out as well. This is just an overview. layout of where the asphalt and where the sod is going to be until the top coating will go on and just some early tackling. So now let's go and start our next project. You can see we're rolling into it. We're in full swing. Uh, we have already started the initial, Phil Daniels has already started the initial erosion control measures. Silt in the first phase of the uh, erosion retention pond uh, has been started. Uh, top soil is being stripped off and the excavation foundations have begun that uh, dirt is being used to uh, build part of the pond. So everything is on track. Phil Daniels went in with some really good procedures to improve the equipment. I know that uh, the number nine rebar has arrived uh, for the footings. We also have rock and other snow has arrived as well. So we are in schedule and I'm proud to report that uh, everything is set to go into the plan. If you notice in this picture, this kind of gives you an overview on the southeast end is where the retention pond is. This is most likely the chapter where uh, the erosion control will happen and you can see the site excavation. Good job. Ready to start construction? Yes, sir. This is uh, my first day. This is the work that we're doing. This is the work. Also in July's meeting, uh, Mr. Schofield will bring the traffic pattern uh, for Legacy Knoll uh, to the board uh, for you to review that and see that. Um, we've worked with the county on that and had numerous meetings with Kevin Poe and Gina Roy regarding uh, traffic on New Skelton and Old Skelton uh, and how that will work out. And so we'll have that information for, for the board as well as the community uh, as parents and bus drivers start bringing students to school in August. It's, it's exciting. We got a lot going on. Uh, I'll, I'll applaud Mr. Farmer's team. They've done a great job uh, keeping everything in front of them. They're working extremely hard. So uh, proud of all of our teams. Um, got four items for action to, to discuss tonight. The first is a intergovernmental agreement uh, between the Board of Ed and the Board of Commissioners. Uh, this agreement's uh, basically partner with the Board of Commissioners to provide use of the gymnasium, athletic fields, and other facilities. Uh, we've had an intergovernmental agreement over the time, uh, but this one also includes uh, the Empower College and Career Academy facility. Uh, it also uh, includes some information of us being the providers of the maintenance on our facilities with the Parks and Rec paying an annual maintenance fee of $100,000. Uh, that fee has an increase every year of 2.5%. Uh, this agreement also uh, includes that the BOC, the Board of Commissioners, is responsible for the initial upgrades for a new track and turf football field in Empower. Uh, yeah, after the completion of the initial project, uh, any subsequent work or needed repairs will be on a 50 50 basis. BOC and the Board of Ed. Um, we've kind of tossed this back and forth with the Board of Commissioners or the uh, the County Manager and his team. Uh, feel like it's a very fair agreement, and uh, want to bring it to your to your uh, knowledge for approval. Uh, 
on Monday nights. Any questions on that one? I don't think I may not have done a really good job of making sure we where this is a 10 year agreement. The initial is a 10 year agreement. There's also a way to get out of the agreement with a 90 day or, or maybe it's a six month agreement, but it's in the it's it's written in the policy of how to come out of that agreement. Uh, I think as a board of ed and just being good stewards and fair stewards with the county, if they invest a large sum of money into that project and we break the agreement, I think the the common knowledge is we're going to make sure we do right under that agreement on a prorated basis. So just for knowledge there. Any comments or questions? We don't foresee any of that going on. We feel like it'll be a lifetime thing. So uh, next item for consideration is the approval of the pr uh, proposals uh, for our, our property and liability insurance and our workers' comp insurance uh, for the upcoming school year. Uh, it looks like each, each June uh, these items have been brought before the board. Uh, we are requesting to transition our uh, coverage to Georgia School Board Association's risk management uh, services group and uh, feel very comfortable with that. We've done our analysis of our prices that were received from our current vendors and from GSBA, and we would like to recommend that move forward with the recommendation to approve moving to uh, receive their services in the future. Total cost of that, the premium at this time is $917,000, $1,425. If we add buses, of course, some money will be added to that. Uh, this would include Legacy Knoll or any facilities we have on our campuses at this time. This would be a, a big savings, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it, it, it was a savings of over $250,000 from the quoted prices of the other vendors. There were two other vendors, one with Workman's Comp and one with the property and liability and vehicle coverages. So there was a savings of $257,571, to be exact, for the initial coverages. Mr. Farmer and his team is also going to item number three, has also done an extensive job looking into waste management. Uh, reviewed several proposals and brought different groups in to discuss options on our uh, waste management situation. Uh, we have been doing, uh, had been using uh, Waste Management Association, it's, it's Georgia Waste Systems. Uh, so been with them over the years. Our, our, due to the research and the price evaluations and them being still better priced and the service being in order, uh, we're just asking to renew that contract for another year. You can see the cost is around $160,000 for that service. Uh, this would add Legacy Knoll to that, of course. They would have one more stop. Uh, as, as we tell them in our world, we say, you're still serving the same number of students, but that number's growing every day. So uh, the amount of waste is going to accumulate over that time and grow. But we felt, we felt pretty certain with that price. We felt it was fair as, as, as so Mr. Farmer and his team had uh, done the evaluations there. Any questions on that one? The fourth item is to uh, approve a purchase of audio enhancement equipment for Maysville Elementary. Uh, during our work session back in March, we discussed this item. Uh, we were, were able to receive prices on the uh, enhancements there for the audio enhancement product. We also chose to include uh, the infrastructure to upgrade their intercom system while we were installing this. There was a little bit of additional cost there, uh, but we feel like with an intercom system that's aging within the next two or three years, this will put us in a position to move full intercom with an IP system. We talked with uh, Mr. Irvin and his staff you know, about the IP, the IP system. I don't know about intercom systems, uh, but it would be an upgrade there uh, at that facility. Uh, the cost of that project is $140,104.56. Uh, 
uh, we're using a cooperative purchasing contract on that item. Any any comments or questions? Uh, we we did. Are you you're saying the uh, intercom system at Maysville? Uh, we looked into that. How many? Two thousand six. Uh, uh, we, you know, as I call them, I said, yes, yeah, it's time. Now, this will not include a full upgrade, but it will put us in position to upgrade it in the next couple of years. So there will be some additional cost when we move there, but this will put us in line to do that. So, well, it will be very clear once we move in that direction. You're, you're exactly correct. We, we feel that way. Uh, I appreciate it, and you all have a good day. Thank you. All right, that concludes our work session. We do have a need to go into executive session. If I can get a motion to do that, please. In a second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We will be back.
I can have a, we do need to get a motion to come back from executive session, please. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And we do need to vote on some personnel issues. Uh, if everyone agrees with the list as they saw this evening, if I can have a motion to approve it, please. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. So, so that passes. And so uh, that's it. So we stand adjourned. <laughs>